Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh my God, it's not morning, it's afternoon. Oh my God. Welcome to Mindset Monday anyway, who cares? Um, it's Bank Holiday Monday and it's a really gorgeous day in Brighton. We've got the Fringe, we've got the Festival, it's all happening, the vibe is really high in Brighton. And yesterday I got back from Agadir in Morocco, so that's why I've got a bit of a tan today. <laughs> um, yeah, Morocco, if you've never been to Morocco, do go. It's such a beautiful place. And despite what you might hear about all the salespeople coming up to you and trying to sell you stuff, actually, the people there are really warm. They are really friendly. They are gorgeous. And yes, there is a huge divide in rich and poor. Um, but you know what? I would love to go over there and teach them about the law of attraction. I think it'd be so powerful if they knew this stuff because they have such passion and um, yeah, I just think they, they need to learn this stuff. So if anybody is watching, <laughs> who knows anybody um, in Morocco that I could speak to, maybe you could tell them about me because I would love to get this message out there a bit wider. So I completely digress. Let's go. My name is Sally Garozzo and this is the place to be to get inspiration and motivation on how to live a more fulfilled life, a happier life um, and a deeply fulfilled life. Um, so there is nothing worse, nothing more frustrating in this life than feeling stuck, feeling out of alignment, feeling like you're in a rut, feeling like you are just repeating the same old stuff over and over again. And today's session is called How to Kick Your Addictions So That You Can Live a Life Without Shackles. And that is exactly what addictions do, right? They keep you shackled, they keep you bound, they keep you sort of low vibe, they stop you from reaching your true inner potential. And there are many, many kinds of addictions too, not just the obvious ones. There are addictions to things like sex and pornography, and maybe you're addicted to that, but you actually want to have a deeper, meaningful relationship. Maybe you're addicted to sugar, but you wanna have a slim, fit, and healthy body. Maybe you are addicted to work, but you wanna have more balance in your life. Maybe you want to deepen your friendships and your relationships, but work is getting in the way. Maybe you are addicted to your own ego, to your own thoughts, to your own kind of self-involved world, but you actually want to be kinder to others. You want to be more, um, how should we say, involved in other people's minds and lives and feel what they feel. Maybe you want to feel more compassion. Maybe you want to feel kinder to others. And there's the obvious one like drugs, alcohol and smoking. Maybe you're addicted to those things, but you just want to be free of all of that. So in essence, the addiction will always block the potential. Okay, so addictions are designed to keep you completely disempowered. They're designed to keep you small and that's how they work. They work because they never satiate you. They never satisfy you. And an addiction will never do this. And that's why you need to reach for more of it each time you go for the addiction. Um, and that's how they work. That's how they have their power over you. So if an addiction was going to make you happy, don't you think it would have done it by now, right? If chocolate was gonna make you happy, don't you think it would have done it by now? But no, it keeps you coming back from more. An addiction can never make you happy. The only thing that an addiction does is disempower you, unless it's a positive addiction, like um, healthy eating. But that's another story. So if you're watching this live, you're obviously you're welcome to share anything with me publicly, or if you want to keep it private, that's absolutely fine. You can send me a direct message. So the definition of an addiction is something that takes you away from a bad feeling towards a good feeling. And like I said, there are obvious addictions like drinking, smoking, drugs, sex, porn, gambling, work, phone use. But there are also not so obvious addictions as well, like an addiction to negativity, an addiction to worry, an addiction to anxiety, an addiction to depression, um, OCD type addictions as well, like mirror checking, and you might 
think, well, how can depression take you away from a bad feeling to a good feeling? Because isn't it already a bad feeling? And this is true, but when you look at the rules of the mind, the mind always prefers and the mind actually loves what is familiar. And if depression and anxiety and these negative emotions have become familiar to you, you will naturally go there even without realizing. So it becomes a kind of, a, of a, a preference of familiarity or a preference of comfort, like an elastic band always going back to the same position. But the good news is <laughs> addictive personalities tend to be um, impulsive, they tend to be spontaneous. Addictive personalities tend to be driven, they tend to be energetic, they are, um, they're, they're quite tenacious as well, they have a lot of attention to detail. So we can of course use those personality traits of an addicted person to create healthier habits like eating healthy, like taking regular exercise, like being kinder to others, like being compassionate towards yourself, like helping others, simplicity, friendliness. These positive traits can become addictions as well because you do actually get a buzz from these things. So I'm gonna give you my three steps to kicking addictions and living a life without shackles. So here we go, grab a pen and paper, take some notes and uh, absorb these tips. So step number one is to understand. So understand where these patterns and behaviors came from and why they are there in your life. Without this understanding, there can be no clarity. And we need clarity because clarity induces change. So understand who or what disrupted your normal relationship to whether it's food, alcohol, sex, drugs, negativity, work, whatever it is, understand what disrupted this normal relationship that you should have, but you don't have. So what happened to you as a child? Okay, because the thing is babies are born, not addicts. You were born, not an addict, okay? Um, babies have the perfect relationship to food. They don't even know about drugs. They don't know about work. Babies completely trust that all of their needs are going to be, be met. Babies don't understand about negativity. Um, they don't understand about anxiety or depression. They love themselves. They don't think there's anything wrong with them. Babies believe they are wonderful and that was you once. But you can very, very quickly make that baby or that child doubt their own ability to function, doubt their doubt their feelings are valid, okay? And this is what addictions are all about. Feeling feelings or quashing feelings. So you can make a baby or a child think that they are innately flawed or wrong just because they feel a certain way, just because they feel confused, just because they feel angry or sad or upset or trapped. And when we understand about these feelings, um, Sorry, let me just read this again. And when our, when our understanding about these feelings gets skewed, we feel wrong on the inside, we feel less than, we feel half a person, we, and then of course we turn to the addiction to make us feel better, okay? So, um, and the other thing is you can absolutely show children how to become addicted to things, not because you want them to be, just because that's how you're living your life. And our parents, with the best will in the world, they try to do a great job for us, but sometimes they don't. And through their own kind of negative habits, they program us. So maybe you watched your mum or your dad eat in a really strange way, or maybe you felt like the only way you could connect with your dad properly and truly was to drink. Um, and also, one of the other things that happens is um, we try to connect with our parents, <coughs> excuse me, by shutting down all the parts of us that we think are wrong. So maybe we were told off for doing something or for just being ourselves. And then we end up kind of shutting that part of us down, which actually 
is really bad for our souls and it makes us feel very trapped. It makes us feel like we are innately wrong. And that's why we turn to drink, drugs, whatever the addiction is. And a big part of the reason why people stay stuck in an addiction is this idea of learned helplessness. So when you're a child, of course, you know, you are helpless, you are at the mercy of the adults around you. Um, but when you're an adult, you are not helpless. You have choice, you have options, you can ask for help, you can do all of the, those things. You're not actually that helpless when you're an adult, you're not dependent. Um, but many of us are still operating with the child's wiring and the thing is we haven't updated the wiring yet so we're adults kind of um, in an adult body but we have a child's wiring saying that we are still helpless that nothing's going to change and this can actually make us feel trapped it can make us feel like we're not going to be understood like we can't ask for help like we can't reach out and so we do the addictive behavior because in that moment, it gives us a feeling of freedom and that's what the soul always requires. The soul is always wanting to move towards a feeling of spaciousness and a feeling of freedom. And so that is what the addiction gives us temporarily. And so perfectionism as well is another big reason why we become addicted or why we sabotage our recovery. So, um, uh, we can have shame around things not being perfect and it's a really big driver for things staying the same. Maybe you were teased or told off for getting something wrong and because your mind has to move you away from pain, it makes sure that you never try anything new, you never take a risk um, and then you end up with this belief that what's the point anyway. But here's the thing, your soul, your inner being actually knows different and your soul wants and needs you to try new things. It needs you to be creative. Your soul needs you to expand. So by blocking it or feeling shame around doing something wrong, you're effectively lying to your soul, your inner being, because nothing could be further from the truth. And I love this idea that mistakes are beautiful. Failure is beautiful. We learn, we grow from these things. It's perfectionism that is ugly, you know. So it doesn't matter. Nobody really cares about things being perfect. And I also think that perfection really alienates people because we're all flawed, we're all imperfect. And when we recognize the imperfection in another person, it means that we can relate. And that is what um, we need to do if we're trying to overcome an addiction. We need to find that relatability in others because at the moment we're, we're trying to find something to relate to that is less than good for us. So we're finding connection in that drink, in that pornography that we're watching or that um, cigarette. It's like that thing, that addiction feels like love at the time, but of course it's not. So what I want you to do is I, I want you to take some action and I want you to grab a journal and you can stop this um, if you're watching the replay, but carry on watching if you're watching live. I want you to close your eyes, I want you to relax and I want you to get into a sort of a meditative state. And I want you in your mind to go back to scenes in your life where your relationship to the thing that you've become addicted to has got disrupted, excuse me. So I want you to write down what you see, what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, and I want you to let those feelings out. And if tears come, that is great, because um, we need to cry to transmute and transform the energy. So this brings me to my next point. You need to understand what feelings, what those feelings are that you are trying to run from, and you need to understand what those feelings are that you are trying to create within yourself so that you can create them organically eventually. I'm gonna give you a few examples. So I had a client who felt a lot of shame around their circumstances. They felt like they were a loser. They felt like, you know, they were worthless. Um, they were sort of a bit older. They were still living at home and they just felt a bit kind of purposeless and they had a lot of shame around their, their situation and drink kind of soothed this shame and it also gave them connection to other people 
in their social circle who were drinking too. So it was temporary belief, um, relief. Um, and of course, it didn't work because it ended up um, compounding the shame. And I had another client who ate lots of sugary foods late at night so that um, in a way to relax um, and in a way to feel like she was in her own body because she spent most of the day looking after kids, looking after a boss and she was always kind of focused out there rather than in here and so the eating was a way of feeling like oh I'm really in my body I can bring my energy back to me but of course it's temporary it's never sustainable and this was a way of like grounding her really so and food does ground us it makes us feel sort of you know like I said in our bodies um, and we do need it and we do need to eat but when we're overeating um, it's just going to cause all manner of health problems and stuff like that. So, um, and another client I had used to work himself into the ground um, in order to sort of feel accomplished really, in order to sort of feel that his existence was validated. And so whenever he took a break, like he found it really, really hard to take a break, to take um, time off for himself, because when he was in that break, he felt rudderless, he felt like, like he was a nobody and so you know we had to work through all of those feelings so work made him feel special in a way so it's really about like I said an addiction promises to take you away from a bad feeling to a good feeling and understanding what that bad feeling is and what that good feeling is is part of your recovery because it gives you clarity and clarity is so important. So you can't go on to step two without first doing step one. So once you've done step one, you are ready for step two. And step two is called accept. So now you know what these feelings are, you need to embrace them, you need to accept them, you need to love them, you need to dig deep within yourself and find a compassionate part of you that can look upon these feelings and not feel sad, that's not what I wanna say, but just feel compassionate, like you would feel compassionate towards a kitten or a small child. And you need to then find a way of dealing with these feelings in a way that is wholesome, wholehearted and life sustaining. So understand that there might have been some feelings that you experienced as a child that were made fun of, that were shunned, that were not expressed, that were quashed, or that were invalidated. But even though the adults around you try to do their best in all of this, you might have felt differently. You might have felt like you weren't taken seriously. But I'm here to tell you that all of your feelings are valid. So repeat after me. All of my feelings are valid. All of my feelings are real. All of my feelings are acceptable given the circumstances. And it's not my fault. So it's about accepting, letting yourself off the hook. This is what step two is all about. And then finding a way of dealing with these negative emotions, with this feeling of feeling trapped or shameful or, or angry or rageful or resentful or stressed or overwhelmed or hopeless or guilty, all of these negative emotions, find a way of dealing with them. And that is unique to everybody, but deal with them you must. You must transmute them, you must transform them. You cannot deny them, you cannot push them down because you can, I mean, you can suppress your feelings, but at the end of the day, you can never eliminate them totally. They will always show up in one area or another, whether it's an addiction, whether it's anxiety, depression, whether it is an autoimmune disease or some kind of physical ailment. So here are some suggestions about how to transform these so-called negative feelings into something else, into something positive. And actually when we do these things I'm about to suggest, we get this feeling of relief of release, it just feels wonderful. So having a good cry, creating a situation or a circumstance where 
you can have a good cry and you can let it all out. We have an inbuilt system, an inbuilt way within us that we can let go of. Tears, tears are wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. And if you're the kind of person that has a stiff upper lip or thinks that crying is for sissies or you know is weak, then you are absolutely wrong. Because crying is one of the best things that you can do for your body. And you know what? I cry regularly. <laughs> I cried this morning. I cried yesterday. It's so great. They just, the emotions come up and then you cry them out. And it's wonderful. It feels so good. And you can create situations that help you to cry, like talking it through with a friend, pick up the phone, talk to a friend, ask to be heard, ask to be listened to. Your friend doesn't have to be a counselor or train. They just have to listen to you, maybe ask you a few questions to enable, to facilitate this process of crying. Maybe you want to Maybe it's not sadness, maybe it's anger, maybe it's overwhelm, maybe it's stress, maybe it, you need something more physical to get your emotions out of the body. And I've just bought a trampoline, a little mini rebounder, and uh, it's in my front room and I just have a bounce, put some music on and maybe just moan and groan or do some humming or do some yelling. You know, the throat chakra as well, the throat center is such an amazing way of discharging negative energy. So it's just a wonderful way. You know, God's given us everything <laughs> or nature. Let's say nature. Nature has given us everything that we need free of charge to to live a happy life. And that's what that's what we want to do. We want to utilize those things. We don't want to reach for things outside of ourselves. So what else can you do? You can just do exercise, you can do yoga, you can run, you can scream. Maybe you want to try dynamic meditation. So dynamic meditation is different to just sitting and focusing on your breath. A dynamic meditation is using music, it's being in a room full of people with the lights off and screaming and yelling and shouting until it's all out of your body. Maybe you want to punch or go on a punch bag in the gym or something. Another good way of transmuting negative energy into positive energy is decluttering, so clearing out a drawer. So yesterday when I got back off my holiday, <laughs> I had a thousand and one things to do and I felt really, really overwhelmed and I found myself just clearing out drawers, thinking, why the hell am I doing this? You know, I've got so many other things that need prioritizing but I'm clearing out a drawer. And I realized I was doing it to um, transmute or transform this, this energy of feeling overwhelmed into feeling more ordered and um, you know organized in my own mind. Another thing that you can do, of course, is singing. And I, you know, I've been a singing teacher for 20 years, so I know the benefits of using your voice. You sing along to anything. It does not matter what you sound like. As long as you put your emotion behind it, um, as long as you go for it and you commit to it. And also, you know, I've just started creating a playlist on Spotify of music that makes me feel like a winner, music that helps me with certain emotions. So maybe, you know, some, some sad stuff in there if you need a good cry, or, um, you know, Fighter by Christina Aguilera if you need to feel like pumped or whatever, choose your own playlist, create music, because music is emotional and music touches the soul. And that's what we need to do if we are going to start taking control of our own lives. We need to start taking control of our emotions and how we deal with our emotions, not suppressing them, but dealing, them with, dealing with them in a mature adult way. So once you have done that step three is then to decide. This is the lightning bolt. This is the decision that you make without thinking to make better choices for yourself, to not do the addiction. So loving yourself enough to unequivocally, blah, blah, unequivocally decide, leaving absolutely no room for doubt in your mind that you will dig so deep deeper than you've ever dug before, to get yourself out of this addictive spiral. Because even with the most supportive people around you, at the end of the day, it is you that has to 
decide not to keep repeating the same addictive patterns over and over again. And this is about really raising your standards about feeling better, about what you want for, your step, for yourself. So lifting your expectations for yourself, lift, raising your standards about feeling better and deciding that you will not settle for anything less than wholesome habits that move you towards a feeling of feeling good, feeling flow, feeling creativity, feeling joy and feeling balance and feeling or enabling connection to other people in a wholesome, wholehearted way and deciding with 100% conviction and clarity that feeling good is your number one priority because that is what you, my friends, deserve. You do deserve to feel good. And decide that you absolutely don't want to experience this aftermath of guilt, of shame, that is inevitable if you do the addiction. And like I said before, if the addiction was going to make you happy, don't you think it would have done that by now? So I know that this requires you to be really brave and to be a little vulnerable, to be right out there on the edge of your comfort zone. But, you know, I believe you will find out what you are made of and then you can use that to help others because that will give your life so much meaning and so much purpose. And you know what, being vulnerable is a good thing. I have so many clients that say, I don't wanna be vulnerable, so I'm using food or drink to make me not vulnerable, to build this wall around me so that nobody can see the vulnerability that I'm feeling. But you know what, vulnerability helps you to connect to others. It, it enables you to actually get what you are looking for. And I am just so inspired by the amazing Brene Brown, um, and if you haven't seen her talk on Netflix, I highly recommend it. She's a shame researcher and she talks a lot about the power of vulnerability. So I find, you know, allowing myself to be vulnerable is actually really humbling um, and highly transformational. So recovering from an addiction requires this level of commitment and it requires this level of consistency and commitment that has to be a daily thing because it's got to be a forever journey. And that means that you are going to have to find something to replace it with, something that I like to call a simple pleasure or a small pleasure. Now, the trouble with addictions is that it really raises our tolerance for excitement and it lowers our tolerance for boredom. And I call this Disneyland syndrome. So when I went to Disneyland, I was taken to Disneyland or Disney World in America twice and when I was in my teens. And then when I came back to the UK and started to do other things like watch other shows or go to other theme parks, they all paled into insignificance because they weren't as good as Disneyland. And so I found it really difficult to find that joy in other things. Um, so that's why I call it Disneyland syndrome, because when you have these addictions, it raises your tolerance for excitement. You want more and more and more excitement. You're pushing the excitement boundaries and it lowers your tolerance for boredom. You become bored really, really quickly. So things like simple pleasures, like a lovely walk on the beach, you know, it just seemed boring and uninteresting or lighting a candle and sitting and doing meditation just seems boring and uninteresting unless you know, you're going for that whole epic spiritual experience. And then even that can become addictive. So things like, you know, looking after yourself can just seem really boring because it's not giving you that instant hit. Things like, you know, simple pleasures, gazing at a loved one, looking at your cat or your dog, or sniffing a flower or creating some art can seem kind of pointless and boring, but if you start to see the beauty in these small things, you have a much better and bigger chance of winning against this addiction. So my mantra is small pleasures provide big wins. So there you go. Um, those are my three steps, but I do have a little bonus step for you. And <laughs> here's my bonus step. 
It's really important, I think, to find some kind of meaning and purpose in your life. And that usually means helping others. So being a mentor to somebody else. That's why in the 12 step program, they have sponsors and sponsees because when you help somebody, you are reinforcing it for yourself, but you also get this hit of kindness and compassion, which is so really, really important. Um, Kindness is transformative. And if you wanna know more about this, check out David R. Hamilton's work. Um, I think his book is called The Art of Kindness. I can't be 100% sure, but do check it out. So, you know, there are always things that you can do. You can mentor somebody, you can go and work in a charity shop half a day a week, you can just do Facebook Lives, imparting wisdom, any kind of wisdom that you've got. You can help disabled people. It doesn't have to be massive. You can give a homeless person some money, you can buy flowers for somebody. Small things help you feel really, really good like this. And they all reinforce the idea that it's you. You are the one that makes the changes, nothing outside of you. You know, even all of this therapy that you can have is great, but at the end of the day, when you go home, you are the one that has to decide to make those changes. So that is all from me today. time for me to go out now and enjoy the bank holiday but I would love to hear from you if any of these things have worked for you or didn't work but if you're still struggling with any kind of addiction and you need a little bit of help then I offer a therapy called rapid transformational therapy which can be done via zoom or with me in person in Brighton so RTT works by going deep 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 into the steps that I've mentioned above and it helps you to clear all of the blocks using the most powerful part of you, the subconscious mind. And it basically gives your mind a massive upgrade. You get a recording to take away with you to reinforce, to rewire your neural pathways. And it's brilliant. And for those of you who don't know, it was designed and developed by the amazing Marissa Peer, and it really is taking over conventional therapy um, because it's rapid and because it's rooted in neuro or the science of neuroplasticity and if you haven't heard of it yet then you will soon because it is becoming a household name so if you want more if you want to follow me on instagram or on facebook my handle is at sally garozzo mind mentor you are welcome to send me a direct message or of course you can email me info at sally Have a wonderful rest of the day and I will see you for Mindset Monday next week. Bye.